Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's better. You are alive. You may be seated. All this week, I've been having this same vision day after day after day. And I didn't realise what it was until I came this morning to speak at the 8.30. And the vision was that uh, there was a person, a male, looking up toward heaven, but he was covered in dirt, literally covered in dirt. And I, I asked myself each day, what is that? It just kept coming back every day. Then yesterday, my wife, who is sat about mid here somewhere, decided to wash the dog. You think, what's that got to do with anything? Well, the dog was pretty grotty. And after the wash, the dog looked clean. But then she went on to wash the cat. And I'm thinking, everything's getting washed. I better move before she starts to wash me. (laughs) But as I'm reading the Word this morning before I came here, I felt the Lord gave me the answer. It was that people have been coming to church, Michael, for years and years. Some people have only been coming for a short time, but they don't feel worthy. They don't feel clean enough or good enough. They look to me, but they they don't let me wash them. They don't let me clean them. Pastor Alan spoke a word two weeks ago in the Friday service and he spoke about how Jesus knelt down, wrapped a towel around himself and washed the feet of the disciples. And Peter, the the larrikin one said, no, Lord, you're not going to wash me. And then Jesus said, Peter, if you don't let me wash you, you can have no part of me. Then Peter lets go with, well, wash all of me then. You see, Peter got the gist of it. Coming to church each week is good. Believing in Jesus is good. There's nothing wrong with those things. But something occurs when you ask Christ into your heart. He said, now let me cleanse you. Let me wash you. Let me make you pure and holy and make you into the bride that I am preparing for the day that I return. How does Jesus wash us? Well, he, he washes us when we read the Word, when we read the Bible every day. This morning I read that there was 5,000 men that Jesus fed and their wives and their children. Well, I'm believing for 10,000 for tonight's Christmas in the square. 5,000 is nothing to Jesus. And He ministered to every single one that needed ministering to. He ministered to them but He cleansed people. He doesn't leave them where they are, filthy and dirty and feeling lousy about themselves. He washes them and then they, when, they walk, when you walk away from Jesus, you should feel like you are the best, the cleanest, the most holiest person in the world. And you go, no, you shouldn't. Yes, you should. Because our minds tell us that we're unworthy and that is true. But the truth is, Jesus wants to set you free from feeling of inadequacy, from feeling filthy, from feeling those feelings that make you not want to tell people. Because if if I was going to church for 30 years or 40 years or however long you've been coming, and I felt like that every Sunday, I would stop coming to church because what's the point? Jesus is saying to me, Michael, I want to wash every single person in this place. I want to clean their feet. I want to clean their lives. I want to set them free. Things that are in your mind. You know what? Christmas time for me was never enjoyable. It was probably the worst time of the year. One Christmas, I remember being chucked into a dam, a frozen over dam and almost drowned. But if a friend hadn't got me, I would have been dead. He saved my life. Another time I went rabbiting with a friend, just catching rabbits with our ferrets. And, and because that's what you did on Christmas Day, by the way, in England anyway. And, and, and we walked along and there was somebody that we knew hanging in a tree. Christmas Day. And so trauma became part of my growing up. It wasn't, it wasn't I looked, I didn't look for it. It was just there. And there are people in this room that Christmas brings nothing but grief and trauma but I don't think that that's what God wants for you this Christmas. I think Bill said it adequately. God is the Prince of Peace. He brings peace. He is peace. He is everything. 
And if you have not got Christ in your heart and you are suffering the anxieties that come with all the things that you have to do, buying this, getting that, doing this, doing that, Jesus says this to you today. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden or burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what? Christmas gets so busy at work. I mean, I've got friends in this room and they're bricklayers and they work in the trade and they've, they know where it's like. People just don't care about anything else other than getting this job done. And, and you and I may have well been in that situation. I don't care that it, you know, I don't care that the cat died. But when you get a builder ringing you up, demanding that you be there while your wife is in ICU and you try and explain it and they go, I don't care. You see, that, that's the world we're living in. This world needs Jesus. It needs the compassion that Jesus brings and places in people's hearts. It needs that soft and gentle spirit to bring peace because as soon as you react with, well, I'm not coming, it just causes arguments. The thing that uh, Cass pointed out about this story, about the, the, the shepherds, was that they were unlikely, weren't they? They were the most unlikely people for God to send a message to that the Saviour of the world had been born. But a lady came up to me this morning and she said, uh, do you know, I, I went to where those shepherds were, in Bethlehem. And she said, uh, I went onto the hills. No, I said, I wanted to go onto the hills. And, and the guide said, well, you can go on the hill, but you'll get shot. <laughs> because it's uh, the war and the trouble over there. Anyway, she didn't go on the hill. But she said, I realised something. Those shepherds were the same shepherds that would have sold lambs for the sacrifice in the temple. They would sell the lambs of sacrifice. And so they had a bit of an inkling that they knew a Messiah was coming. They were Jewish, obviously, because they were selling to the Jews. And they knew that the, this Messiah was going to be the Saviour. They knew that the lambs that they sacrificed was the lamb to sacrifice and that a lamb was coming, a man was coming to be that lamb. And Jesus was that lamb. And so they went, when they went to see Jesus, they didn't just see a baby. They saw the Lamb of God. They saw the Saviour. They saw the sacrifice. And it wouldn't be until 33 years later when Jesus was grown and a man and had been gone around doing good in Galilee. I mean, if you've been reading the readings, you should be excited that God can do all that stuff then, but He can still do it today. I mean, my, my wife lay in ICU two weeks ago and I anointed her with that much oil I ran out. I was crying and praying and saying, Lord, you, I just tipped it over anyway. The nurses were gone. And one nurse came and she said, oh, are you Christians? And Carolyn, when she was coming out of the ICU, she said, yes, we are. Oh, and I started praying with your husband as well. So I had the nurses praying with us. And just as an aside, can I tell this little story? Because Carolyn was in hospital and this lady was cleaning. And I said to her, Oh, what time do you start work? And she says, oh, five o'clock. I went, oh, that's early. But I have to get up at 3.30, 4 o'clock to get to work and travel here. And she said, I, I, I do a lot of hours. I said, how many hours do you do? She said, I work seven days a week from five till three every day. And she's in bed by seven. Well, straight away, the antenna go out. Why would somebody want to work seven days a week? I said, what's going on? She says, oh... Have you got time? I said, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. And Carol, <laughs> she's off waiting for the doctor. So yeah, that's all right. So she starts to tell me the horrible story. She went home from work one Sunday afternoon, went out the back door, and there was her 33-year-old son, hung himself. And so I, asked, I said, oh, wow, uh, tell me what happened. She said, the ambul I rang the ambulance um, the ambulance person said, can you cut him down? And so she cut him down and he fell on top of her and it was all traumatic and it was awful, just an awful, awful thing. And bear in mind, I've just nearly th thought that I'm going to lose my wife. And so I've got this tremendous sense of aware awareness of what it might be like to lose someone. And I'm thinking, God, you know how she feels because you lost your son. 
You gave us your son, Jesus. How, how can I help her? How can we do something to help this poor lady? And so I said, would you mind? Her name was Maria, believe it or not, Maria. Would you mind if I prayed for you? And she said, oh, that would be lovely. And so Carol and I both prayed for this lady in the hospital room. And I'm thinking, she nearly died. We're here praying for people. And that's God. You see, opportunities don't wait for the circumstances to be perfect. And you're going to go into circumstances over Christmas where you're going to be able to do exactly that. Just pray for somebody. Let them know that the Saviour of the world loves them and wants to minister to them. And then Carolyn, after just nearly dying, says, I've got a word for you. And I'm going, what? She said, "Uh, look, your trauma is not going to be wasted. She said, your trauma is going to be used to help many other people who to get over this. Because she went on to tell us after that, she said, oh, well, you wouldn't believe this. She said, I went to a meeting where we did a walk for people who have suffered, uh, people who have suffered suicide. And there was hundreds of people there. And she said, you know what? I, I all of a sudden didn't feel alone. I knew there were other people that were going through what I had gone through. And that's when Carol said, well, you can help others, you know. That's your gift to the, gift to the world now. And if you want, you know, we, we can, we, you can come along to church. And we did plug the Friday, not the Saturday, Sunday. We said, 11 o'clock on Friday, we've got a service. And, and, and she said, oh, when is it? And I told, we told her, oh, I might come along. What am I saying that for? Well, hope is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ in people's lives, they have no hope. The only hope they have is that He'll find them, awaken them to that knowledge that He loves them, wants the best for them, wants them to live a life that's godly and good and not living a life that's filled with all the filth and stuff that the world brings. He wants to purify them, help them. And I'm no exception. I'm not perfect, but God is working in me every single moment of the day. The Bible says, He who has begun a good work will complete it, will finish it. On the day that He returns, I'll be perfect. My wife thinks I'm perfect now. (laughs) All right, Lord, I'm sorry. I won't tell more lies. I I won't lie. You know what, when you watch the news and stuff like the lady said, it's just horrendous, this times we're living in. I mean, imagine going on a cruise to White Island and then all of a sudden you're stuck and a volcano erupts. I mean, that, what's that about? But I had a glimpse of what hell might be like, just a glimpse, and I'm glad I wasn't there because 300 degrees is pretty hot. They would have died instantly. They wouldn't have lived for long at all. In fact, my wife was saying that if they breathe in any of that stuff, they just die of a heart attack instantly, the, the fumes from a volcanic eruption. But Jesus, just the other day as I was reading, said, there's a place where there will be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there will be no rest, no relief, And I think to myself, God, I do not want any person that I speak to or see any day of the week to go there. And yet Jesus says, come to me, come to me, Jesus, all you who are heavy burdened or laden, and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When I came to Christ Prior to that, Christmas, as I said, were just horrendous. Our first Christmas with our daughter, we had nothing. I mean nothing. Welfare would come and check on us that we had enough food for the baby. Uh, there, was, there was no money. Zit. Zero. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know anything about, I knew a little bit about God and Christmas. Christmas Day that year, uh, Sarah was six months old. I actually wept on Christmas Day. In fact, I think I was suicidal. I think I would have, if it hadn't been for good people around me, I think I would have ended it. I couldn't see another Christmas like that. It was so hard. 
And then for the welfare to say, well, we, we might have to think about taking the baby from you. Like, come on, what sort of a Christmas was that? But then I, f- then I found Jesus. No, I didn't find him, he found me. And it's gotten better as the years have gone on. It's so good now. I love Christmas now. I love having Christmas with my grandkids. And whoever said it's better to give than receive, well, I know it's the Lord, but <laughs> I like to receive. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so if you want to buy me a present, that's fine. Because <laughs> my wife came up with this idea, I was going to say something else there, where we do Chris Kringle. And she puts a budget limit on it. And I'm thinking, why? <laughs> I like nice things. So anyway, we all get a name out of a hat and we buy that gift and that's what it's all about, apparently. You can get the gist of where I'm at, don't you? Yeah. But you know what? That's what Christmas should be about. It's about Jesus. About the gift He is to the world. About the gift that He brings for the world and for every person in the world. John 3.16 says, quite simply, For God so loved all of you and the world, that He gave Jesus, His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. I think this is, somebody said to me, this has been an awful year for me. And I think it's been an awful year for many of us, for many of you. There are things that have happened that we wish and pray that never happen, but they've happened nonetheless. You know what a burden is? A burden is something that you carry that Jesus wants to take from you. He loves you so much that He didn't die on the cross just so that you could go through life suffering. He suffered so that we might not. He suffered that we might come to Him with all of our cares, all of our anxieties, all of the things that trouble us and lay lay them at His feet. And you know what? He's taken it all. He didn't just be born so we could have Father Christmas and presents. He didn't live 33 years and show us a whole lifestyle, a way of living, just so that we could, you know, enjoy everything, and which is good. But He wants us to know that He loves us and wants us to be with Him. After He washed the disciples' feet, Thomas piped, as Jesus said, you know the way, the way to get to be where I'm going? Thomas, well, how do we know how to get there? Thomas, the doubter. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go there now to prepare a place for you. And if it wasn't true, I wouldn't say it. Do you know what? I am so glad that I have introduced people to Jesus and that they have a place in heaven. And you know what? I reckon I could say there are people sitting in this room that I've introduced to Jesus And I'm so glad that you're here because you can tell people that you know Jesus and so can they. Finance. You know what? The first Christmas here in Australia, I was broke. I'd spent everything. $2,500 we landed in Australia with. I bought a car and a bed. That's all I had. No cash, no nothing. But I came to this church and I prayed. I prayed every, every week, I'd pray, Lord, help me with the finance, help me get work, help me do stuff that I need to do. And, and God came through every single time. One time we got a bill around Christmas time, which they always seem to come just before Christmas, don't they? Those rotten bills. And I pray, I said, God, are you going to provide? You have to provide. I can't do it. I've got the rent to pay. I've got food to buy, this to do, that to do. And I went to the post box and there was an envelope with $800 in it. It covered the bill. It even paid for a holiday for us. I'm not saying God's going to do that every time. But the Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. I always look to God first. I always do. I thank Him in the middle of all of the rotten things that go on. I thank Him and praise Him and then I ask Him. You see, 
Praise should precede a prayer. Don't just go in, oh God, I need this, I need that. Oh, that's like a spoiled brat. I mean, you go to God and say, God, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my children. I thank you, God. I praise you that we are here today. I thank you, Lord. I pray for those who have not got what they need. I pray for them, Father. You help them. You give them, Father, the, the means by which they can live and do things. God, help these people. And then I'll say, Lord, would you help me too? Because I need help. I need help in my relationships. I need help in my work. I'll tell you a little story. I was doing a job for somebody and... Um, it was for the Van Hooks. And Neil Van Hook had asked me to do a renovation for him. And I was going to start the weekend after, the week after Neil tragically passed away. Sharon came up to me and said, Michael, uh, I still want you to do the work. And I went, Are you sure? Yep. And uh, they have some really good friends in this church. And I, I would consider myself a friend of theirs too. Two of the friends actually physically came up to me and said, now look here, Michael, like that. You make sure you do a good job for Sharon. Do you understand me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Gotcha. Then the next gentleman came to me and said, um, now, Michael, you know this is a very bad situation and we want you to do the right thing by Sharon. You will do the right thing, won't you, Michael? Yes, yes. So I started the renovation. There's, a, there's one guy here who was there on the day. And um, what happened was we propped up the roof, as you're supposed to, with uh, props. And then we took out this whole wall. I mean, it was probably the longest wall in the downstairs between the kitchen and the lounge room. So it made it into a big room. And I was dead proud of myself because we knocked out this wall. And Sharon was, oh, it's looking good, Mick, looking good. I'm just going to the shops. And so she goes out, and then I hear, Rrr. Rrr. I thought, what's that? And then it started to make a creaking like a real, and I realised the actual, uh, the whole building was starting to compress. And the props, so I got down on my knees, I didn't pray at that stage. I got down on my knees and looked under and there was nothing between the floorboards and the concrete foundation. The whole roof was sitting on top of just timber. So I started to panic. I went, God help me. This is not, this can't be happening. I actually started to cry. And the doorbell rang and it was Evan Zumas. I said, Evan, pray. And I, he said, no, heaven. And I said, heaven, help me. <laughs> Not heaven, help me. Evan, help me. He just gave me the flowers and I said, see you, Mick. <laughs> so I was praying like crazy. But then the Lord said to me, chalk underneath the floorboards, you nitwit. I mean, literally, just chalk under the floorboards. It was as simple as that. It just came to me in a flash. Chalked under the floorboards. Job done. Everything saved. Roof didn't fall in. Sharon got a record price for a house. And praise God, everything went well. But when those times happen, that's when you really pray, isn't it? You know, when, when the rubber hits the road and the proverbial happens, you just get on your knees and you start to pray. And you know, the beautiful thing is, God won't hold that against you. As soon as you ask him, it's, he says, I'll answer you. <laughs> Sometimes it might be no. Sometimes it's no. Bill Scalaptus rang me a couple of weeks back and said, Mick, can you come and pray for my uh, sister-in-law? She's not well. I said, yeah, sure. He said, no, I mean, she's not well. And so I said, Bill, we're going to pray a few days before I go and minister because this sounds, it's Mick, it's serious. You need to come. Anoint her with oil and pray. So I'm praying during the week and getting ready for work and doing my devotion in the morning. And then I, I kept thinking, ring Bill, tell him to pray. Ring Bill, tell him to pray. I said, pray every day, five days. And on Friday, we'll go. So we went there on the Friday and I went into the room and uh, she was asleep. And um, 
Bill gently is ever so gentle. Walk her up. Wake up. She cut, bright as a button. Like, I mean, didn't look like someone that was dying to me. Looked like someone that had been healed. And uh, I th- Joy, Joy, is it Joy? Yeah, Joy. Great name. Anyway, um, I start talking to her and she says, oh, I feel great. I feel wonderful. And um, I said, Joy, do you have Jesus in your heart? She said, what do you mean? So I explained the gospel to her. I said, look, if you ask Jesus to come into your heart, he'll enter into your life and he'll save you and your soul will go to be with him in heaven when you die. You just ask him to forgive you of all your sin and he will and ask him into your life and he'll enter in. And then when you pass away, you're going to be in heaven. Oh, that sounds beautiful, she said. Let's do it. So I led her through the sinner's prayer. And Bill Scalaptus comes out and he says to me, How did you do that? I've been praying for her for 30 years and you just walk in and do it. I said, It wasn't me, Bill. Who do you think it was? Who do you know it was? It was God, the Holy Spirit, moving in her heart. And God, the Holy Spirit, is moving in people's hearts here because he does not want them to perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. I'm going to ask you today to ask Christ into your hearts. I want to ask those who even believe to be refreshed in Christ. I'm going to even ask those that have been a Christian all their lives to ask Christ afresh into their hearts because we need to do that. We need to do that. Linda brought a lady to church on uh, Friday two weeks ago and the lady came in and she had heaps of problems. I mean loads of problems. She came forward for prayer. Pastor Alan Steele prayed with her. We anointed her with oil, laid hands on her. She came to church, I think, on the Sunday here. Rang Linda and said, Linda, I've recommitted my life to Christ. I've given my heart to Jesus again. And I just feel so free. She said, I felt the depression and the anxiety lift. She said, I feel tremendous. I feel brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda for bringing me to the Christian Family Centre. Next morning, she died. Just like that. No cause whatsoever. No heart attack, no hemorrhaging, no overdose, no pills, nothing. She just passed away. Who did that? The same God that saved Joy. The same God that saved me. Because I kid you not, without God in my life, I would be an absolute mess. Jesus, the hope giver, Jesus, the life giver, came into our lives and changed us forever. And he can do that. If you want rest from the Christmas hustle and bustle, if you want rest for your soul, come to Christ. Come to Christ. This is what Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Do you know why I like preaching to kids? Do you know why? Because they listen to every single word. And when I ask them, do they believe in Jesus? They just, oh, yes. Do you want Jesus to come in? Oh, yes. Do you know that he, d- yes, I do. So you'll accept G- Yes, I will. Not one, all of them. And Jesus points, he says, come to me, but come like a child, my child. Don't come with your knowledge. Don't come with your theology. Don't come with all, all the things, all the resistance. Just let your guard down. Let your guard down. Just relax. Should we dance? I went into a pub in England. It's the highest in uh, Tan, Tan Hill. It's a true story. And, and we're in this pub and you get a meal there. And it's the highest pub in England. The, hi- the highest. That means altitude. Not, you don't get high there. You have a... Anyway, we're in this pub. And, and my telephone rang. And he went, oi. 
Five, five quid. I went, what? Yeah, five quid. I said, what do you mean? His telephone rings in here, mate. This is for conversation. And this, is, this place is for conversation and relaxing. It either goes in, the, in this pickle jar. He had a pickle jar full of telephones. Because <laughs> people wouldn't give him the $5, uh, five quid. I just paid, I paid the five quid. Now the five quid went for Mountain Rescue. Because it's a, you know, a really good cause. I reckon if a phone goes off in church, <laughs> not, not from today, no, this is from now. <laughs> You've got to give the 5,000 for the, for the uh, Christmas in the square. <laughs> uh, I tell you what. Carolyn tells me off because I actually make my telephone ring in the middle of things just to make it a bit more exciting. So. <laughs> Because sometimes sermons can be pretty boring. <laughs> but um, Alan Steele and I and the team, more Alan than me, is so, what's the word? Oh, what is it when you're so passionate about something you will not give up? What's the word? Oh, is that all right? He's resolute. Give me some more words like that for Alan. I want to build him up. You know, breakout has been a blessing for me. I see kids who need Christ. I see kids who are hungry for Jesus, who accept him because their lives, you wouldn't wish it on, you wouldn't wish it on anyone. Not all of them, some. So he, he messaged me today, Mick, are you going to church today? I was already here. I said, yeah. He said, well, go and pick three kids up. Bring them to church. Okay. You see, Alan knows what it is to face the other side. He knows what it is to be closer to heaven than anyone else. Because he was diagnosed with something that was going to take his life. I knew him before and he was passionate then. He was resolute then. But when this happened to him, he became almost obsessed by it. Every minute of every day is spent working, working to get people to know Jesus, doing things to bring people to Christ, organising cars, organising lifts, making sure that people get along to a service. Why? Because he understands how close we all are to the other side. He understands that these kids may not even see the next week. And he understands that when we speak the gospel, they receive it like children because they are children. In fact, a lot of their parents are like children. They haven't developed, they haven't matured, they haven't grown up. And that's the truth of it. This society has kept people so locked away in these little drug worlds, alcohol worlds. It's not doing them any good at all, but they can't get out of it. They were born into it. And that's why Jesus came. He came to shine a light and to show the light and bring them to Himself. He came to give them a hope and a future and something that they would never have if they stay where they are. And yet people still come into the church me included, and still carry the, the residue and stuff that comes along with it. But God is saying to us today, I want to get rid of it from you. I want to cleanse you from that. If you come into church week by week by week by week and leaving exactly the same, I want to challenge you to reach out to Jesus today and say, enough is enough. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day I'm going to get rid of this thing. This has dogged me for too long now. It's over. You can do it. You can just come to Christ and He will meet you at your point of need. Don't try and evaluate. I cannot explain how God does what God does. I cannot. There is not a man or a woman alive that can because they're not God. Why would God come as a baby? Why would He grow up in a time when He could have been killed at any drop of the hat? Why, when He knew that Herod was going to kill all them babies, when He knew that 
you know, people would, would try and kill him. He still did it for you and for me. If you're going into this Christmas period and you are struggling, I kid you not, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Pray. Prayer is the doorway to finding rest. You pray and you ask God and he will come alongside of you and miraculously embrace you. I was praying for a lady this morning and I said, uh, I, f- I feel God's got his hand all over you, like embracing you. She says, I feel that too. And the lady praying with me said, I feel that too. It was good. It was good for me because I, I like to hear that God is doing what God does. And I like to hear that people are allowing God to do what God does. Your marriage might be rocky. When mine is, I cry out, let me tell you. Your work situation may be dogged or you know, really not good. God can help you in that. Your finance might be up the creek, but God can help you, give you strategies, give you ideas. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm going to finish on this. I have been probably the most untrustworthy person in the world. I say that not, not feeling bad about it, that's the truth. I, I'm saved, I'm delivered, I'm set free. And God is transforming me on a daily basis as I walk through this world. And on the day that he comes, I will be perfect, as I've said before. But if you can't, you, you often hear people say, you can't trust them, all they want is your money. That's not true. That's just not true. All we want is for you to be well. All we want is for you to be free. All we want is you to be anxiously, uh, not anxious, but to be free from anxiety. That's what we want. That's what ministers want. They don't want you to feel, if you're feeling that, oh, they just want to put on you all this. No, 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 no. Rest is what we want for you. Peace is what we want for you. Deliverance is what we want for you. And if anyone tells you anything else, that's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the devil. I feel that we should, look, just think about this. Where are you at? Have you got Christ in your heart? And if you have, thank him. But if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, I want to ask you to accept him today. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer. In fact, I think we'll all pray the prayer. And if you wouldn't mind, what about if you just put your hand where your heart, think, I always get it wrong, but put your, put your hand where you think your heart is. Thank you, Lord. You may want to pray this prayer after me. You may do it silently in your head, but I believe you should do it just by speaking the words. So after me, if you would, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming into the world. I thank you for dying on a cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong. Come into my heart and help me in my life. Amen.